Open it up, Justin. Open it up? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want to. I don't want to. Can we keep that in there, Doug, please? If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. I had a really good time because uh, after Matt dropped off, or you got dropped off here, <laughs> we hung out afterwards and ended up chopping up forever. And I love when we meet people like, because we, I've met, we've met a ton of people yeah. uh, interviewing stuff like that. And I like pretty much all of them, like all of them I like. And then there, there's like levels of how much I really like somebody. He's one of the best it's like somebody you could hang out oh, with like, right. beyond this. I never said yeah, totally if that. he was somebody who, yeah. who was up the road from us, you know what I'm saying? If he didn't like, get on a plane to go see him all the time, we would, For sure. we would hang out. He's a cool guy, really smart guy. He's like a bigger, stronger version of Justin. He, yeah, I know, I know. So I felt <laughs> the same thing. I was a little bit like, man. I wish I could do all the cool shit you can do because, uh, yeah, yeah, we're like the same guy. No, he's hilarious. Uh, he's very sharp witted. Uh, he's a compet. He was an ex competitor, right? He used to compete in the two time hi- world champion in the Highland Games. Yep, which is a it's a strength sport. Very. I, I love to even hear him talk about that because the way he makes fun of himself. With oh that. yeah, he's like, ah, it's not even a real sport. No, yeah, no, like, he's, come on, dude. He's fucking really very humble. Very right? humble guy. Very yeah. humble guy. Very cool guy. Very down to earth guy. Um, for sure, will be. A friend of ours for quite some And his time. clothing line, right? What's his clothing line called? Hate, it's a big but with with the uh, the Roman numerals. So yes. the H and then V I I I. And it's a very successful I mean, he started it himself. I love hearing stories like yeah. this, right? Uh he was a, obviously in a strength sport, wanted to turn that into a business somehow, came up with his clothing line, which is doing very well. I mean, it's legit stuff. Like me and Adam both we oh, were no. like, Oh, when, when's the Black Friday sale? We're like going for it, man, because it, it like it's stuff I'd actually no. Rock. I, dro- I dropped over three hundred bucks on his gear. Did you really? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, it's I, sick. I, wait, you'll see. That's yeah, weird. I should get it this week. He sent me a bunch of free stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> his, uh, you can find his apparel. Would be that guy. At that, that kind of friend. Thehate.com, <laughs> you know I mean? but it's hate Roman num- Roman uh, no, what? Roman no- numerals. That was weird. Uh, it's the h v i i dot com. He's uh, three eyes. Sorry, h v i i i dot com. Yeah. Uh, you can find him on Instagram at. I H V I I I Matt Vincent, um, and he has a podcast. He's actually got a new podcast. He's a good podcast. Yeah, we were on his too. Yeah, we were on his podcast. His podcast is called Um So. So U M and then S O. You get how it. You get how that works, right? What? The, the I hate Matt Vincent. Yeah, I got it. Okay, I'm just yeah. wondering if you can yeah, even tell it to the audience. Oh, I just had to spell it out because yeah, I said okay. hate. I was, like, I was like, you get that's yeah. the Roman numeral. I literally for eight got. That. I literally got it right the second. <laughs> I didn't get wow. it before. That's oh, you did. As you read it, that's you got good. it. No, I, Justin's like hate Roman. And like, oh, Roman numerals. Yes, yeah. excellent. Yeah. So uh, here we are talking to Matt Vincent. So last night I recorded with uh, uh, Jen Wiederstrom and um, Jeff Nichols, my Navy SEAL buddy. And uh, we recorded at Jen's house and like, oh, what do we want to talk about? Blah, 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 blah. So we ended up setting it up on the table in front of us and we watched Commando and critiqued it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> classic. You know, that's classic. one of, that's you're one doing of, it wrong, Arnold. Yeah. That's one of those yeah. movies when you're a kid, it's awesome. And then when you're an adult and you watch it later, you're like, whoa, that's terrible. <laughs> Everything's so fake, yeah, so I'm, bad. I'm yelling about like continuity issues in the film. I'm like, why, oh, why yeah. would that be a thing that that guy has? And she's yelling about how great Arnold, like what shape he's in. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and like won't let us badmouth Arnold at all. And I'm yelling about, you look at that stunt double. It doesn't yeah. even look anything remember, like remember it. The, remember the ending? <laughs> When he throws, he throws. Well, he's name? got the guy hanging over the Let, cliff. No, he throws. What oh, was yeah. that line? Oh yeah, uh, that was a great no, one. No, he throws. Uh, a, uh, you're a funny guy. I like you. That's why I'm going to kill, kill you, you last. last. Yeah. Kill you last. <laughs> Me- yeah. Remember when he throws the guy that the guy through the pipe or whatever? Yeah, he throws it through straight yeah. through him. Let off some steam. Yeah. <laughs> Better. Dude, Classic. Merrick's wearing that like. Like macrame vest the entire time. I don't know if it's if I'm supposed to believe that's like some weird chain mail, but oh, that guy's yeah, in right. that guy's in terrible shape. That's right. That's <laughs> like right. just the opposite, Arnold. You're not gonna fight uh, Arnold. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know what movie he you did like though? A knife. I actually had this conversation with my friend the other day because we were huge when I was a kid. Me, my cousin, and our buddy Wes were huge Arnold fans, like all action heroes. But the yeah. one movie that has stood the test of time is Predator. The original Predator is still a badass movie when you watch it. No, original Predator. Yeah, good. the other yeah. like Commando, like you know, Red Heat and all that stuff. You're like, oh my god, <laughs> yeah, that was a terrible. stretch. Well, yeah. Predator, how many years later though? Predator came quite a way. It was it's quite a bit later than those. No, uh, Predator's not yeah. that much later. 
Really? No, not that much. It was after Commando? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it was yeah. after Commando. It was after Commando, but it wasn't that much after Commando. Because it was uh, Conan, Commando. We should find out. Yeah, I know. Now you was that the order? Was Google. it Conan? I know Conan's first. Conan, yeah, 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 yeah. Conan's first. That was like his no, breakthrough, right? No, Hercules right. in New York was Hercules first. Hercules in New York. He's actually like, uh, I, bet I you think guys his title is like Arnold Strong. Arnold Strong. Because I couldn't fucking bother spelling his name at that point. You know, he used to have to <laughs> used to have to have argue with people because they wouldn't they didn't want to put his last name. Because like, that's not going to work. Your last name is too crazy. Yeah. He's stuck to his Smith. Guns. Well, he's, he's one of Smith. he's one of probably a hundred people who tried to make that play, and we never know any of the others. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're like, right. just do it like Arnold outside the bell curve. <laughs> yeah, 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 those yeah. rules will apply yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <So> Predator <laughs> was in 1987. 1987 was Predator. Yeah. So what? 85 is Commando. Commando okay. was 85. Okay. Yeah, that was sweet and too. Yeah. Carl Weathers. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. God, so many great okay, lines. In I'm gonna Predator. say the way they split his name up there. That's. Oh, because it didn't all fit. <laughs> that's, uh, the, Schwazi. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the lines, though. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Remember yeah. he kicks the door that down? doesn't work. Throws a knife through the guy, and he's like, stick around. Uh, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's after Terminator. Yes, is Terminator it? was Because he says, I'll be back in Commando. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Terminator 1984. Which was Amazing. also a classic. Or, yeah, kicks the door down, knock, knock, when he blasts everybody. Yeah, what, a, yeah. what a weird existence like Arnold Schwarzenegger has to have had, right? Like, I mean, you're, you're essentially... The most famous person in any room you've walked in since like what, eighty? Yeah, yeah. Right. he's he is the if and I'll argue this all day long and I will win this argument with anybody. If he represents, <laughs> he's very confident. Arnold right? represents the American dream better than anybody I can think of. Yeah. Better than anybody, and he's not even American. He's an that's why yeah. that's why he represents yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. immigrant who comes to this country doesn't and, speak English doesn't speak English at all. He says I'm going to become the best bodybuilder in the world, which he does. Then he says I'm going to become rich which he does before he becomes an actor people don't realize this he made a lot of money in construction yeah, and business and, and as a bodybuilder and selling you know protein powders and all that stuff then he says i'm going to become the highest paid here uh, movie star action hero no yeah. just movie star oh yeah and everybody laughed They're like you can't speak english yeah. you're a bodybuilder <laughs> terrible nobody, actor everybody yeah. made fun of bodybuilders back then terrible actor like no way does it becomes the highest paid one of the highest paid actors of all time then he marries a kennedy Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then he's like, I'm going to become the governor of the most yeah. populous state in the country as yeah. a Republican. Yeah, he's essentially running the third largest, like third largest economy on the planet. Yeah. 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 And he, be, as a Republican, he became the governor of California, like Democrat land. This right. was the start as a Republican, to us just and, voting as a popularity contest oh, to put someone in office. Oh, right. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I believe that tw within 12 years, The Rock will be the Dwayne's president. on the way. Right. Yeah. Don't you agree? But then the only problem I have with that, right, is. I, I feel like Dwayne's pretty smart, and he's gonna see that it's a horrible fuck would job. You want that job? Yeah. yeah. You know what I think it you is. Go, I'm so like, yeah. Let me get this right. You have to spend a billion dollars to earn a job that pays four hundred grand. Right. Oh, ego. It's the power. Why would you want? It's to the do power, that? right? Because at that point, you've accomplished almost everything else. It's a right? terrible job. You just admit that, that that guy doesn't do much, like, like as far as like the president <laughs> yeah. as an actual person. Yeah. Can we all just admit this that? is like a mascot? Yeah. Yes. Totally. That's exactly what it is. You're a target. Is what you are. Yeah, but we we are. Job. I mean, how can you stop that? If if we if we allow, I mean, if you can go in and vote, right? And now almost everybody is on Facebook now. Almost everybody is mm -hmm. on these social media platforms, and that you can be. And Donald Trump was an example of somebody who you utilized that. Yep. You know, hate hate him or love him, he did that fucking very well, and he's paving the way for probably who's going to do it the ne next yeah, one. Right. And it's just going. I think they're just going to keep one upping each other until. You know, it's going to be a popularity contest, and you're right. It's it's. It was, I vote they're Kardashian. a mascot. They're a mascot, oh. anyways. The, they're not making the decisions, right? It's yeah. everybody. Yeah, it's, I hope, it's American I hope Idol. That's true. <laughs> like I hope that that guy's not making decisions. <laughs> <laughs> we'll yeah. see. We'll see what happens. So I I want you to share a story because um, oh, no. I know I know yes. I know yes no yes. before we go to that oh. one I know, I know. I'm not going to make you go there first. All right. uh, I don't know if these guys know. Um, I remember. The first time that I, uh, I came across you was actually I found you. I think Joe Rogan reposted your coffee. Yeah, mug. I had a coffee mug mm -hmm. that got reposted. Joe Sh Rogan Day. Show that, share that story. Uh, Taylor was briefly telling me a little bit too about it that uh, you weren't even ready for that. Day. No, no, not even close. Right. So we we've, we've been in business at that point with Hate Brand a year, uh, it was damn near a full year. So we'd put the coffee mug out, and we're still doing stuff like limited release, things like that. So we, like, we make this mug. We ordered our standard quantity. We got, I think, 300 of them. I'm like, well, this this will hold till Christmas. You know, this is like early, <laughs> right, early right. Uh, like end of October. And uh, sure enough, like, it's yeah, November 2nd, 2015. It's Joe Rogan Day. 
And uh, like I get a I get a text from a friend. It's like, holy shit, dude, Joe Rogan just reposted your mug. And I'm like, what? So I look it up, and I'd taken a photo that morning with uh, like two bags of caveman coffee in my mug and, and uh, sent it over to the guy at Caveman that I know. And uh, he reposted it, and then Joe reposted it and tagged us in it. And so I was like, we've got, at this point, like probably... I don't know, 150 mugs in stock. Now, what does the mug say on it? Just says, kick today in the day. It's one that yes. we, yeah, yeah, I saw yeah, Taylor yeah. Post, yeah. yeah. And so that's ended Great up kind song. of being, our, that, being our thing, right? And um, so he posts this thing and like sales just. And so like my, my partner calls me, he's like, we, we've only got like 140 of these left. Like, what, what do you want me to do? Because we're, we've blasted through that in like the first 10 minutes mm-hmm. since this thing's been posted. Oh, like, wow. Wow, like, it's that powerful. Oh, dude, I was like, let it fucking run. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we will send fucking emails and we will apologize and yeah. say we did not expect this on to their happen. Way. Yeah. Right. yeah, I'm sorry, but we have to like reorder them, and I know it's going to take like six weeks. Give them IOUs, right? Yeah. And so yeah. we end up selling like over the course of the next four days, like I don't know, eleven hundred mugs. Wow. wow, damn. And it's we've never never stopped carrying that mug. That's still, so- we still sell about a thousand of them a quarter. It's been. That's so great. How crazy is that? The power of and that's a one, repost. The Oprah that's that's a podcasting. repost, yeah. right. like not an organic post by Rogan. Yeah. Yeah. That was just a repost that he didn't on his write Instagram. In. Or what? Yeah, on Instagram. And he didn't even that, talk about it on his, his podcast. He didn't even talk about it on his podcast. No, no, not even close. Wow. wow, just to show you the power of one person. That's yeah. why like Oprah was like that. Like if you, oh, Oprah could make or break your life. Yeah, if yeah. you got on her show and she talked about your book, you're a bestseller. Yeah, guaranteed. Yep. That's crazy. That's insane. Yeah. Wow. So tell us about uh, your how, what you compete in, what that's all about. And you do Highland Games competition. Yeah. yeah. So and a lot Highland of our Games. listeners have no idea. It's it's a strength sport, but they yep. have no idea yeah. what it entails, what it's it. like. I think it's. I consider it one of the most. I mean, you know, manly. It's fun. Strength sports. That, yeah. That, that it's exists. good fun, right? So you know, my background was a thrower in college. Uh, shot put discus and hammer at LSU, and then. Just spent some years doing some powerlifting, did some uh, strongman, and was really average at both of them, and made my way and found a Highland game to do, and um, really, really enjoyed it. Took well to it. If you threw for 10 years prior to getting to the Highland games, it's essentially cheating. Oh, you, wow. you, it all makes sense. Okay. So, really? But instead of you know doing three events, we now have nine. So we do two stone throws that are really similar to the shot put. We do two hammer throws. We do two weights for distance and we do um, a weight over a bar a caber and the sheaf which is like a 20 pound hay bale thing you throw with a pitchfork hmm. so got into that really really enjoyed it that was 2008 did my first game or 2009 did my first game in november 2010 uh, did a full season essentially traveling around and then uh, went professional at the end of 2011 how do you become professional at the um, it's a little bit of just throw your hands in the air and say, I'm now professional, uh, <laughs> All right. but, uh, the path that it worked out for me, which isn't, I don't even think it's in existence anymore to do it. There was something of a federation at the time and, uh, they hosted an amateur world championship. Uh, I went and did that and won and that was right at the end of 2011. And so what I'd understood was if I win that, I get an automatic invite to the 2012 professional world championship so i'm like sweet hmm. i'll stay amateur another year do this game get the automatic invite so do that and uh like talking to him like where are you guys going to host worlds next year you know blah 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 blah. and he's like uh, oh it's going to be loon mountain in new hampshire i'm like well that's where you guys are doing it this year and he's like yeah it's in a couple weeks oh, and i'm shit. like which which worlds am i invited to <laughs> and they're like yeah the one in a couple weeks i'm like Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's on. So went and, you know, man, perfect spot to be in. I'm as in good a shape to throw at that time as I could be. I'm complete rookie. First professional competition is at the world championships. Oh, wow. So just went out, hair on fire and let him fucking have it. Took second. Wow. And uh, won, the, won the following year. Oh, badass. How's the vibe towards Americans? Uh, oh, it's fun, dude. Yeah. It's fun. I mean, I've heard that the culture is uh, around the Highland Games is, is similar to Strongman in that everybody's a super fucking having a great time. Everybody's cool. And the professional ranks 100%. 100%. We're, for me, I always thought that the professional side of things, everybody was in on the joke a little bit of like, this is fucking kind of silly. I mean, we're, <laughs> let's be honest about this. There's people paying us and flying us out and putting us up in hotels and we have prize money for fucking throwing rocks in a field today that we're going to measure. <laughs> yeah, this is that's awesome. Yeah. You know, you know, all, all the professionals were also 
did other sports. Uh, my brother does it. He was an NFL guy and most of the other guys <clears throat> through in college. So we're all used to doing other things. Mm-hmm. The amateurs get, they get a little bit to the point where it's like they're looking for something to define them. And that's where I ran into it with Strongman too. I'm like, come on, man, fucking take it easy, bud. We're in a fucking GNC parking lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, we're forced here to listen to Disturbed and, and carry stuff around a GNC parking lot. <laughs> let's, Ooh, fucking, wow. let's, let's pump the brakes on how down with the sickness we are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, you've been around it for a long time, so have you seen the sport evolve for potentially the good and the bad? Yeah, yeah. of course. And, and the coolest thing is, like, I think now more athletes are finding it as like another opportunity to stay in competition and stay doing things. And so now there's more information too about like, where do you find games and how do you get into the sport and Mm -hmm. what are the events and, and well shit, how would I actually train for that? And so that's been cool to share all that type of stuff. Right. Mm. Yeah. Cause I actually looked into that and there was like, uh, it was like clubs in the local area that would have it and they would host it and all that. And I was curious, like, how do you even like get in, you have to get into the club kind of circuit or. Yeah. And and like, there's not really, it's not like a club or anything like that. And there's no federations. There's no, any of that with Highland games. We're essentially paid entertainment at some festival. Got it. And so, which is oh, cool. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Because so some Renaissance festival or something sure, everybody like Everybody else this, right? is drinking and doing shit awesome. everywhere else. Yeah. So great. we have crowds. Yeah. Which is also the same reason they can pay us hmm. to, to compete. And so my recommendation to anyone is like, look up Renaissance Festival Highland Games in your area. Find one and just go do it. And go have a good time. Just go be fucking terrible at it. Yeah. Like you only, you're only allowed to be a kook for so long in your sport. <laughs> and like, you're going to be the first time you do it whether or not you spent the last six months really giving a shit. So right, just right. go be a kook. Right. Have a good time and then figure out, is this something I'd like to invest the rest of my time in before you buy all the stuff? Yeah. <laughs> before you go now, there's deep. a long history behind Highland Games. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah, yeah, Do you know any? Can you of go course, over that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's been around in Scotland forever. And so essentially when the English had started taking over Scotland and doing stuff like that, they took all their weapons. And so these were ways that the clans could meet together and have some type of a physical challenge or a way to train for battle with it not seeming like uh, smashing swords. Mm. So you'd throw rocks and they had, you know, counterweights from the scale. So we threw a we throw a twenty eight pound weight for distance, and we throw a fifty six pound for distance. And so we throw a fifty six pound over a bar, which is four stone or something like that, whatever the translation is. And these were, you know, weights that they used to measure grain and stuff like that. And you know, the weights of become more of a throwing implement now than what they started as. And so a lot of the games, you know, that I've done in Scotland have been around a really long time. Like, oh, this is the seven hundredth running of, oh, wow. of this game. And it's really cool because it's also like seven hundred years? Yeah. Wow. Shit. Holy shit. That's yeah. And so That's deep. And then you have some of those that have done a really good job of um like maintaining things. And so you've got like field records and stuff like that were set with that stone. Well, so it's the same stone. Yeah. Holy cow. That's well, some awesome. of the other implements wear out and stuff like that, but sure. occasionally you get a good one. Oh, that's cool. You know, that, now, that's are there, like, fuck yeah. Have you encountered hmm. some of these? Uh, because it's there's nothing like competing in something that's got such a long lineage and comparing yourself to how people were hundreds of years ago in terms of performance. Sure. I think a lot of times we incorrectly assume that because today we're modern – that, oh, we're just better at everything than people were a few hundred years ago. And in some cases, that's not the case. I mean, I remember really learning about the democratization of sports and learning how much equipment played a role in breaking new records, like cycle, you know, cyclists or the mm-hmm. or the track or the shoe or, the you know, the, a new technique of, of jumping or whatever, and how much that plays a role versus just the physical performance and just how people back then were fucking badasses too – do, have you seen records of some of these competitions where you're like, oh, this record has been up here for 130 years? Or this there's, one's there's nothing that long. There's some records, like older records. Uh, I tied I tied one of the stone records for the world record. It was like 63-3 or something like that. And the owner of that record is Brian Oldfield, who was like a four-time Olympian world record holder in the shot put. Oh, wow. So you've got a couple records like that, and Jeff Cast was another okay. Olympian. And these are all guys from kind of the 80s that post track and field had got into something else. So they're like peak. Yeah, yeah. These are legit athletes. And Mm -hmm. so the records have been around long enough that most of the owners now are 
pretty much somebody. Current. But yeah, but I mean, there's such a difference now. I mean, most so the average thrower in the professional ranks of the Highland Games now is. I think someone did the top twenty of us, and there was you know the average is six three three ten. Oh, big boys. oh, just big dudes, big boys. Yeah. You know, I mean, those people didn't exist six hundred years ago. Yeah, mm. we we just didn't have enough food. Mm-hmm. Or if they yeah. did, they might not have com- competed. Yeah, they or they were been... worried about things like say their village being set on fire. Yeah, right? yeah. So they not were, they were <laughs> what riding. I concern myself and, with and, every day. Pillaging, <laughs> right? Pillaging. You know? yeah. What is uh, lots of pillaging? How much of your training is devoted to skill versus just most? Especially early on. Um, you know, kind of the rule of thumb I always told people is like, don't fucking waste all your time like trying to build this 600-pound squat if if your technique in the sport that you give a shit is so bad that you can only transfer 30% of the energy mm-hmm. into the implement, right? So you'd be better off having a 300-pound squat and transferring 100% of your energy. Mm-hmm. 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 You know, that's less wear and tear, and it's a hell of a lot easier to improve technique in your first two years at like a specialty sport than it is to add... 200 pounds to your squat mm-hmm. now that's a very intelligent theory right there how do you apply that in your training like give an example of like how you would do that so when in doubt go throw more yeah you know so it's it's reps it's always going to take reps and i mean what did i do to get better at the sport i mean so as, as having a throwing background i managed to you know i didn't have a coach or anything but i could video and i could critique myself and see where i'm screwing stuff up and i'd thrown long enough that i had enough feel for the sport so what i did was i would take 60 throws per event uh, a week for the entire year. And so it was throw first. I'm plenty strong until I can make this work. Why are we focusing on getting stronger? Mm. Everyone goes, it's easy to get stronger. And that's, that's where it, people default and go there. But that's a much more general. And a lot of people don't understand that. Like there's general foundational kind of adaptations <clears throat> And then they become more and more specific mm-hmm. based on, you know, whatever comp- sport you're doing. So you can build, for example, general uh, endurance, but that doesn't mean you're going to swim longer than somebody who's got excellent technique in the water and knows how to use that endurance, you know, in a swim. And the same thing is true with strength. You can have some incredible – I mean, it's funny because uh, many times, you know, I, I was a, a grappler for uh, quite a while and – I was usually stronger than the other person just because I had a background in lifting weights. And for my body weight, I'm pretty strong for my sure. weight. Obviously, bigger guys than me are stronger than me. But if you know, if I'm going against a 190-pound guy in jiu-jitsu, typically, if we go to the gym, I'm going to out deadlift, squat, bench, whatever. But there's guys I would grab and just pure strength in grappling, they would, they, I would feel like I'd be manhandled. Then I'd go take them to the gym. And I did this many times. I'd take these guys to the gym and we'd lift, and they couldn't squat 225. They right. couldn't They couldn't pull 300 pounds off the floor. They couldn't bench press over 200 pounds. And I remember initially I'd be shocked that these people weren't that strong. And then I realized, like, it's just it's just different. It's a it's, different skill. It's different. They can apply their strength differently than I can, whereas I can squat and deadlift more and whatever. But then when we grapple, it was a completely different, different story. Right. You know, and, and that applies with the throwing thing and the way i try to explain it to people is like people get overwhelmed and it's like oh you know i get stronger this thing's heavy and the truth is like none of the shit we throw is heavy i mean l- let's be honest we all lift and so like yeah, the 50 he- pounds is not heavy. 56 pounds not fucking heavy there's not a move in the gym that i could be like hey could you do this with a 60 pound dumbbell be like yeah <laughs> yeah i could <laughs> not yeah, I a could big curl. not a big deal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right however how do i apply a 400 pound clean to something that only weighs 60 pounds mm. Mm. And that's leverage, that's technique, that's trying to figure out, you know, biomechanically, how do I get my hips in front so that I'm using my legs to throw something that weighs 60 pounds, not my arm and shoulder. Mm -hmm. And that's technique. And that's going to come from the repetition. And what I recommend doing to build that repetition is keep working. How, what's the furthest you can throw with the least amount of effort is where you want to be. Oh, interesting. And, And so most of my training practices working on technique were, you know, it'd start off really slow and throughout the, the, you know, 20 or 40 throws were, let me throw just further than the last throw. Like what's, what's the least amount of effort I have to put in to throw just further than the last one. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you pick up six inches, six inches, four inches, you know, a foot. And at some point you'll hit one that's relatively effortless and it's a bomb. And then when you take your next one, you're like, shit. I've got to get my shit together That's to beat that like. one. Wow, yeah. so you can really feel the difference of your technique. Like, Can you know as soon as it re- comes out of your hand? Oh, 100%. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Really? 
Yeah, if it's a bomb, you know it. Oh, that's great. It crazy. slows down a little bit. You just feel things line up, and you finish dead on balance, like both mm. feet planted. You know that all of the energy and momentum that you created with spinning went into that. Oh, that's cool. Mm. You know, it's essentially like slamming a door, right? right? You know, when you really slam it, you don't move. You transferred everything into it. Right. Mm. Or it's like hitting a baseball or a exactly. golf right? Like right. You know when you hit that sweet yeah. spot, yeah. it seems Just effortless, right? Now, yes. But now if you blow out to the side or do anything, I think that's wasted energy that went yeah. this way instead of that. Oh, wow. Now, did the 10,000-hour sort of rule apply here? Like, what do you think? When, when do you think you started to kind of get in the groove of it? I'm sure I got into the groove of it learning how to throw in college, right? Yeah. You know, so I, I already knew the point that everything has to be led with my right hip. You know, the further distance that I can create between my right hip and my right arm holding the implement, the further it's going to go. Hmm. So I already knew that. But then things came together in the Highland Games. I remember during the first full season I competed, like things started clicking and I started hitting big throws and then started hitting big throws really consistently. And then when they started getting consistent, like that's when things get fun. Hmm. Like that's the best thing in the world about throwing is when it, when it, when it just starts lining up and the techniques there and you've built enough hours into it that, I mean, there's a lot of variables in the throw, right? You know, so I've got to think, you know, shift my weight over the left foot, turn. I need to kick the right foot out. I've got to switch the hip in front. I need to land, keep the right foot turning, land, keep the shoulders behind you know, push the right foot through, block with the left shoulder, initiate the shoulder, push the hand out, finish, reverse, stay in. Yeah. You know, for sounds simple. Yeah, yeah, for the stone, right? It's a fucking lot of steps. <laughs> no, this I, is all one side driven. Do you ever go on the other side? You don't have time. Yeah, you don't have time for that. You don't have time to be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just this is your sacrifice Just to try to be good it. at a yeah. sport. Look, Asymmetrical. Sport, all day. Yeah. yeah. There's no such thing as sports at a high end. That are healthy. That are thank dysfunctional. you. Yeah. God, thank you. Yes. There's a big fucking difference between someone who wants to be a competitive athlete and someone who's a participant. God, so yes. true. No, that's, that's this is something that, that we try and talk we about. We talk about that all the time. All the time is yeah. that like, is, nothing... is riding a bike healthy? Fuck yeah. Right. Yeah. Is competing in the Tour de France? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. A little different. Yeah. Right. So, so true. Matt, I want to get into your business mind a little bit, man, because you seem like a pretty savvy business dude. Oof. When you started doing the Highland Games, did, did you do it with the intent to build a <laughs> business or are you no, just having no. fun no <laughs> how, uh, tell me how that all played out then how did we get here so i did my first season um competing and at the time i'm traveling a lot for work and uh hanging out with some different people on the road and, and i would always kind of book meetings around where i had a competition or there was a gym i wanted to try to go see what kind of work this. are you doing right now this time so at this point i'm doing outside sales in a oil and gas petrochemical field and so I'm um, chasing turnarounds, doing stuff of like that. Of course you for, did sales. You you're very, you I communicate know. very well. Yeah. Weird. We, we recognize <laughs> our guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar that what I am professionally is a salesman. <laughs> I know this is my skill. <laughs> and so at that time of traveling and uh, ended up meeting up and hanging out a lot with uh, Jim Windler. And so as mm. we're chatting in this time, and this is, this is probably 2009, 2010. How did you know him? Hmm. Uh, I had done a long trip up the East Coast for sales. It was actually a really weird week. I'd done like two weeks up the East Coast seeing people from essentially South Carolina all the way up to Pennsylvania. I'd finished the trip. I'm like, fuck yeah, heading home tomorrow. 19 hours back to Louisiana. Get a call from a customer and they're like, hey, we need someone to come out tomorrow morning, you know, Monday morning. This was a Friday. You know, we need someone here Monday morning at nine o'clock to come look at these drawings and, you know, see what we need for this upcoming work. <clears throat> like, cool. You're in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. I'm in Philly. That is not on the way home. <laughs> so drive over the weekend. Ugh. And since I'm on the week, so I'm in Philadelphia where there's a gym, Iron Sport. Uh, Steve Pulsanella runs. And he knows Dave Tate and the guys from Elite. So mm -hmm. he connects me. And he's like, hey, a buddy of mine's going to come through. Do you mind if he trains? So I end up training at Elite over the weekend. And while I'm in there, Windler comes through and we hit it off. So we hit it off over, I don't know, it was a really awful day of running Prowler. Uh, at that time, like everyone kind of dies during it. And then he and I are just still running and going. So we end up shooting the shit, going to dinner and hanging out and have just been friends since. Oh, wow. And uh, at the time he's like, anybody ever written a book for Highland Games? And I'm like, nope. And he's like, are you gonna? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and he's mm -hmm. like, you should. Otherwise, I'm going to. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow. There's like, your motivation. Putting the heat on well, you, huh? Yeah. Well, all right. And I was like, I don't even know how you'd go about doing that. He's like, oh, it's easy. And so we talk and stuff like that. And so he kind of mentored me through it. 
And uh, so I wrote a book basically laying out my training for the games. The training for the games at that point, like essentially everybody was just meatheads. And so it was guys doing different powerlifting stuff like this to get good to the games. I'm like, why wouldn't you just train like a thrower? Yeah. The way we did in college. It's right. it's different. We compete 20 times a year. Right. You know, you don't do four contests like the way you do in powerlifting. So part of competing 20 times a year and trying to peak for three games of the season is some of these you're not going to be your best at. Right. Because you train straight through them. Right. This is an organized practice for you to get used to competing. Mm. Mm-hmm. And if you don't look at it that way, I'm not saying you're not going to throw well. But you may have done 10 sets of 10 on squats, you know, 48 hours before the competition. Right. Wow. So you actually account for that. Like, yeah, oh, you have these, to. Yeah. Like, this contest doesn't matter. You're like, yeah. Well, you're doing 20 of them. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, oh, yeah. For you, sure. you can't peak for 20, you know, most seasons I did 22, 23 games. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you wow. just can't peak for 23 weeks from May until September. Now, well, are there com- some that help your ranks more than others as far as the events are concerned? No, not not so far as the events are concerned. The ranking always came from, because we do the same nine events every week. It's not like Strongman. You know, it's never a change. And so you could rank people decathlon-style scoring throughout the country no matter where they threw. And so that gave you your top ten. Is this okay. common to compete so much in, in the high- In the Highland Games, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not nearly as physically abusive on the body as Strongman or powerlifting or any of that, right? And so... I mean, for example, the last year I competed was 2016 and was in Scotland for 16 days, and I competed 11 times. Wow. It's brutal. Wow. But I mean, you get used to it. Mm-hmm. And you know, the biggest difference you learn as a thrower competing that much is like how to turn it on and how to turn it off. Mm. You just can't stay up for, for that. You know, the way, the way you see guys just Oh, yeah. all geeked out like so oh, you man. you decide you, you decide up. to write a book yeah so i ended up writing a book wrote um throwing lab is a or training lab is the first one i wrote and essentially broke down here's what you should do for your entire season of lifting if you're this many any many weeks out from a competition that fucking matters here's how you'd set up a peak here's how you would you know build a speed and power program here's how you would do strength cycle here's how you would do your off season mm-hmm and so put that out and sold sold some copies. And one of the things I wrote about in the book was uh, the hate, the mentality kind of where the brand had come from. And, you know, basically describing that, like, you know, these athletes like your Jerry Rice, your, your guys like these that you'd hear these stories about that, like, you know, despite the Jerry Rice is the best, you know, wide receiver in the history of football, that this guy is still out running hills, mm-hmm. you know, at, at 4 a.m. He's catching breaks. He's still practicing routes and like that fucking guy hates himself more than I do, (laughs) you know? And so, you know, be willing as an athlete to, to own that, that like be willing to outwork your competition. Mm. I mean, I, I can't be any taller. I can't do any of those things. So I can either dwell on that or say, what can I do? And what I can do is show up on time. I can, I can outwork you and I can put in the effort, put in the reps and, you know, so hate yourself more than the next guy. You know, a little bit of self-loathing goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, that's essentially where the, you know, the uh, mentality came from. And so I talked about that and so wrote the, another book. The brand is born at that point. Yeah, at the brand is born, right. So wrote another book, uh, Throwing Lab, which broke down all the throws from a technical standpoint. It's, it's a good book. It is terrible to fucking write. <laughs> it's essentially bullet points of what I just said about the stone. Mm-hmm. But are you, are you blowing people's minds at this point? Because you're saying that the no, way everybody's no training. One, there's not that many people. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's Highland Games. I'm, I'm selling dozens it's of these a month. Niche. It's yeah, great. A group you know? of people, yeah. yeah. The number one Highlands game but it's, seller. It, it is selling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's yeah. a weird spot because nobody's done this right. with the games. And so, they, you know, the old guard's a little pissy. Like, oh, this guy coming in here telling yeah. people yeah, how to Being the authority right? of everything. Yeah. Right. And so I put this book out. Like, here's how I'm training for the full season. Did it. Won a world championship. Mm. Boom. Which is also really weird because success doesn't teach you very much. Failure teaches you a shitload. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, like, taking second place the year before, I was like, all right, what do we fucking change? Where, where, where was I weak? Where do I do this? I win the next year, and I'm like, all right, well, that worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it's like preservation. Repeat? Or, yeah. <laughs> like, you would just start yeah. over? Yeah. So, uh, ended up doing that and had those two books out. And then uh, at the end of 2014, you know, fans and stuff like that were asking, you know, you put out a shirt, put out a shirt, do the, you know, the hate shirt, you know, blah, blah. I'm like, Ugh, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't have time to ship stuff. Like I have a job yeah. that, that pays well in a, in a career. And like, I don't have time to go ship 
go to the post office every day this week just to sell one shirt a day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right. a lot of people don't realize that. Like, so I try to start three different clothing lines as a kid growing up yeah. to where I'm at now. And I remember when mind pump really started taking off, that was, you know, all the fans are like, Oh, make the shirts, make the shirts. And I'm like, you guys don't understand. Like there's just, there's not as much money as you think. Just fucking snap my yeah, fingers. Yeah. <laughs> and you're not going to get rich off of it. No. You're really not. Like when you start to no. add in like what, what it costs to now pay somebody to yeah. handle all the shipping and all it's like, you're not make, you're not getting, becoming a millionaire unless you're already somebody who's Joe Rogan's type famous. Then you can right. But put, then, sell then again, it's still the smallest thing that's bringing income to his, you yeah. know what I mean? Exactly. Joe totally. Rogan. No, exactly. The model today, I think, with apparel is you don't look at it as your money maker. You look at it as more advertising. Yeah. You know and, what I mean? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's gone well. Um, so we, we did that. And, and essentially, so I'm like, I don't want to do it because I know I don't have time and I'm not going to be able to do it well. And, you know, you can't tell people like, well, I ship every Thursday. Right. <laughs> the fucking Amazon exists. Right. You can't tell people who, you know, who ordered on a Saturday that like, I oh, will get it out sometime next week. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Uh, Another guy I'd met through through Windler, who was uh, helping Windler with his apparel. He's like, "Hey man, I own a you know a print company, and I've got a warehouse, and I can do all your drop shipping. I can do everything for you." Is that at Kansas City? And I'm like, ah, "What do you think?" And he's like, "Look, run a pre-sale, see who orders. We fulfill it, take whatever profit we have, buy more inventory." I was like, "Okay, there's no risk to that. Yeah, that's no problem. I don't have fucking any risk at all." So we did it. Sell. 50 shirts over the the one week that i've got pre-sale up rolled those into more shirts bought more shirts <coughs> it's just been doing that since oh wow yeah and what? ever ever since then it's just been now have you left the other job completely oh, yeah. and that's all yeah now? so they they decided uh they fired me in march of this year and like i can sell that any way i want to i mean they didn't want to keep pursuing pursuing uh stuff in louisiana where i was it was about four and a half hours from the main office and, you know, they just weren't growing that way and didn't want to put an office by me and fill it with people for me to actually sell. Mm. Whereas all my competition in the area has that. So if I'm trying to compete, like I've got to pay per diem to a group of guys who comes and does the work. It's just not competitive. And so uh, they let me go. And uh, I, mean, I didn't get fired because I was like stealing from them or anything. But as far <laughs> as I'm concerned, they decided one morning that they weren't interested in giving me a paycheck for my job anymore. That's getting fired. Yeah. So yeah. they uh, they let me go, and I was like, "Well, I guess we'll make a run at this fucking apparel thing." <laughs> right. You know, and the wife was cool, and you know, I'm really, really glad at that point I didn't walk inside and say, "I think I'd like to start an apparel company." Yeah, that'd be a terrible idea. But <laughs> since it was already working, right, it's going great. So that's that's essentially what I do for a living now is that and the, you know YouTube and podcast and I've got some sponsors and stuff like that. What so. do you so what are you liking about that? Because this is a total career shift when you think about it. It's it's great. It's great because I essentially wake up every day and do whatever the fuck I want. Right. And so that whatever the fuck I want is get on a plane and go to Denver and talk to these people that inspire me or meet some new people and find some new life experience and do this type of stuff. What's going to make me a better me? Hmm. And that's really what I'm chasing. That's cool. Um, what are things that you're doing now that to make you a better you? What are things you're into? Um, it's it's really trying to su surround myself right with you know like minded people, but not the same mind. I'm not I'm not looking to be validated by the people I talk to or or books I read or anything like that. I want something new. I want a new insight. I want new life experience. I want mm. those type of things, and I'm really enjoying getting feedback and helping other people realize that they can do the same. Right. And travel's always been big for me. And now that I don't have this other job, I kind of travel as I want to. Um, but it's, it's meeting new, interesting people like your Kyle Kingsbury, who's got mm -hmm. a complete different outlook on a lot of things than I've had. Um, and I, just open to everything, right? Like yeah. the way I feel about it is like, show up, be a novice. Have you always been like that open-minded for growth? Or is that something that did something, a pivotal time in your eye for you? Like, I need to fucking change. I mean, I feel like I've always have been, but for sure, pivotal role, I guess, would be um, I'm 34 now, I'll be 35 in April. And when I was 31, or I just turned 31, uh, my father died. My uh, my dad got pancreatic cancer mm -hmm. and, and it passed away, right? Um, and was when he died, he was 62. And so the only thing, like we didn't have a weird relationship or any of that. Things were fucking great. It's just super sad. Fucking dad died, right? And uh, 
How old was your dad when he died? 62. Oh, he was young. Yeah, so I was 31 at the time, and I just couldn't help thinking, and I kept having this fucking loud voice in my ear. I was like, you're fucking halfway. Oh, that's the first thing that just went through my head yeah, when you said that. you're right fucking there. halfway. <clears throat> and if that's true, what the fuck are you doing? Hmm. And like that was a that was a big fucking moment, man. And and part of that was like gas pedal, mm-hmm. you know. Let let's go, let's go. Because I couldn't. Me you know, my dad worked in a pet, you know, worked in the oil and gas industry as a welder, boiler maker. Made a great living. Took care of myself, my brother, my mom, and and all this shit. And you know, it was a good dad. And they had just basically started like getting out and traveling and doing stuff for them, uh, in probably the last four or five years before he had passed. And because, because you got time, you're fucking young, you're 60, Mm -hmm. you know, but he never took care of himself or anything like that. And not that that's how you get pancreatic cancer, but he definitely didn't put any cards in his favor. Mm -hmm. And so like, I just couldn't, you know, he got sick on a trip with him mom and fucking came home, went to the doctor and 11 months later, he's dead. And so like, man, fuck, I can get hit by a fucking bus tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So let's go. Yeah. You know, and if I, if I look at things like that, that this time is fleeting, right? That the fucking clock is ticking and I've got today. This is all I'm certain of. I don't have tomorrow and you know, I don't have yesterday. That shit is done. Good or bad, that check's cashed. Mm-hmm. And so, so what can I do today? What can I do more of to not waste any of that time? Mm. You, you know? have kids? Uh, I know you're married. No, no kids. No kids. No kids yet. Yeah. We, we spent about a year and a half trying and unsuccessfully mm-hmm. and so mm. that gets weirdly stressful too mm. so essentially we've kind of pumped the brakes on that and like if the universe decides that we're going to have kids we'll have kids mm-hmm. there's nothing i can do about it anyway mm. you just hang out with me <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> yeah fuck yeah i do hella cool shit bro no, yeah, same. yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Cool shit. <laughs> no it's it's one of those laughing things we my wife and i've talked about you know our friends who were all you know our age with kids and shit like that i'm like Oh, cool! You guys went to go watch a, a Wiggles reunion. <laughs> oh man, I went. I went to. Oh, it's so true. My wife and I went to Italy for the yeah, weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> our, our story just started. Nah, it's cool. the same thing. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. oh, you're broke. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got my, money, my yeah. girl and I said we've been together for seven years. We're 36 and 37. Say it all the time, and we're not anti having kids. Yeah, right, right, if it, right. If, like you said, if the universe lets it happen; it happens, type of deal. But right now. Mm-hmm. But we had those exact same because all of them, you see everyone married and having kids now. Oh, it's the best thing ever! And I'm like, really? Because well, would- I mean, look, <laughs> I, I think honestly, like if I would have had the, the you know the, the fucking the first job that I had in the petrochemical industry as a sales guy, like if I'd have had that job and that was going to be it for the next thirty years, right? Doing that, grinding it out. Oh, I'd have kids by now because hmm. I, I have a lot less options, right? And kids are an option that would have worked great for that life, right? Mm-hmm. But now I've kind of broke into a weird spot where the options are what I need to do to keep growing the thing that now pays our bills is, is go and meet and do because people aren't coming to me yeah. and I'll never expect that. Mm. You know, I want to go and experience people on their turf. Mm. Yeah, that's rad. Not bring them into my fucking little weird world. And so that's, that's what I'm into. Mm. And, and so Make a run at it and see that's, what we can find. That's man. such a great attitude. You got a fantastic attitude. When when we first started, I remember people couldn't put it together. Where we we didn't. A lot of people don't know this, so this will be the first time I think, I think we share this on the podcast. That you know we had to we had to front the money to fly. We flew yeah. our guests yeah. in. We how we did everything to get them to come on because when we were small and we we're just getting started, and the fuck yeah, they don't it was mind pump. We're not gonna come. Right. I'm gonna come on your show, and so. We had to. We had to actually. I mean, it was a, a, a major hustle, and we would go any. We still do that. We just got back from L.A. We did a, a ten shows in three days, and and so none of that shit's cheap. Yeah, no, not no. at all. Not it's not it's not cheap. It's a lot of it's a lot of work, and it's a grind. But it's also super rewarding too. I think you, right. You have to know because mm-hmm. what we're the mindset you have right now, like man, the amount of growth that we've gone through in the last three years with meeting all these really really cool people have you had anybody that um just totally wowed you that you weren't that you weren't ready for and you were like oh i did not expect that that person to be like this um probably kelly sturette ah uh so i'd started a youtube channel and i'd filmed like a bunch of training and bullshit and regular things you do and you're like oh, i can make videos using my flip cam and uh posted a bunch of that and then i I got with a buddy of mine and i was like dude i got an idea for a project i'd really like to do and I like traveling. I know some interesting people and I've definitely got connections to other interesting people through that network. And so I wanted to film, you know, this, uh, the drift to lift a series that I've got on my YouTube channel. And so we do it about once a year. 
So this is 2014, something, whatever. And so I've decided, like, fuck, we're going to go do this. And so I talked to my buddy. We're going to fly out to California. We're going to interview Kelly. We're going to interview Mark Bell and go talk to Jesse Burdick. And I've, I've known Mark, and Great so lineup. then I know Jesse and I know Kelly. So we go in and, and meet with Kelly, and, man, fucking ground's running. But, I mean, like, all this was my bill. You know, I paid for this because it was something I wanted to create. Right. And uh, go and talk to him, and, and he and I and his wife hit it off. Uh, I think we hit it off talking about mid-century modern furniture. So I, <laughs> who knows? Super random. Yeah, it wasn't overstretching. And so, <laughs> and so since then, I mean, like Mark Kelly and Jesse are are, are really, really close friends. Mm. And I, I would say more than anyone else, like I really get along with Kelly very well. We, uh, he he's as close to kind of mentor role for a lot of stuff that mm. I've ever had. Good and people, um, he's he's great people. They're wildly positive. You know, he and his family and kids are amazing. And we've got, a, you know, they're, they're family friends at this point. And so, I mean, we stay with them for New Year's. Well, we were up there a couple weeks ago. And uh, in July or June, my wife will know better. We've got a 16-day rafting and camping trip in the Grand Canyon with Kelly and Juliet and, oh, and their cool. kids awesome. and, a, and a bunch of other people. And that should be that should be really, really good. Have you trip. done that before? No, I, I heard no, that's no. amazing yeah, to do that. Yeah, it's like no phone disconnect. Yeah, no, for, that's the big 16. Yeah. You're shitting in a five five gallon yeah. bucket and stuff like that. I've, yeah, had, so I've had family and friends that done that. Should so be cool. Said it's awesome. So, you know, to kind of get ready for that, you know, the wife and I were talking about things. I was like, let's fucking drive out. Let's drive out to Arizona to do it. Oh, She's wow. like, yeah. And I'm like, look, man. After 16 days of, of like disconnect and, and this environment of this close knit group and kind of this tribal thing that you get from that and, and getting to actually know these people, I just don't know that I can stomach going to the airport. Mm. Fucking hate the airport. Oh, so mm. I like going places. Yeah. <laughs> but if we could, if we could, if the Japanese could stop building machines we could have sex with and come up with teleportation. <laughs> Hey, hey, we're making progress <laughs> right, there, buddy. Right, that's what I'm saying. If we yeah. could knock this out in like the next half hour, fucking great. <laughs> but they're getting hotter every day. <sighs> I know. And they are really good. It's worth, it's worth every penny. Yeah. And, and so I just don't want to go to the airport and be super fucking bummed out. Like after that trip, like I don't need to be that by integration back into society. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, we can't stand the airport. Yeah. Uh, it's the worst. That's yeah. actually that's actually a, a really unique strategy that I don't even know if I would think about when you put it out there like that. That makes a lot of sense. You just have this incredible, you know, being disconnected from tech and others, yeah. and you're in nature and you're with a tight group, like you're saying, to get right back on yeah. a plane. And right. Where Otherwise, people are rude hurting, yeah. and yeah, and hurting just, cattle at that point yeah. versus riding home with your wife where you can probably download all exactly. the stuff that you That's guys. That's exactly right. And I've got, you know, we got a rooftop tent on the truck, so we'll drive through a couple of national parks and camp and, and hang oh, out. Oh, that's and, awesome. You know, and like, that's, that's what I want to do. I mean, look, I've, it, it's really interesting because of the change of things. And, and after 20 years of, you know, competing and lifting and doing stuff like that, now that I'm essentially not throwing anymore because of my knee, like I'm still interested in lifting that, that's not going anywhere. That's just ingrained now in the DNA and something I've got to do sometimes during the week. Mm. But I want to be out of the fucking gym. Yeah. Like, how do I get outside? Probably the most underrated side of competing in the Highland Games is you just throw outside all day. That's yeah. it's so different. Oh, yeah. Man. I remember totally the first time I, I did that, that me and my, uh, when I, I owned a personal training studio, me and my partner had kettlebells and was like, hey, let's take these apart. Just, just chuck them. And I, I, it was the most fun yeah. I'd ever had. With weights. Yeah, it's it's fucking great, man. And so I want to be outside more. I'd like to, you know, do more mountain biking, do some hiking and, you know, some stuff that I'm fucking bad at, like, you know, weird long hikes or like a multiple day hike and shit like that. I want to be out of my comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you did you grow up small town or are you? Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. You did? No, it's Louisiana. So there's not like if there's a lot of options for Metropolis. The whole, so, the whole and, state has like four million people in it. And now you're doing Denver's and New York's yeah. and Austin's and San Jose's. I mean, what what's your take? Does it make you like where you're at, where you live even more? Or does it make you want to move to somewhere else? It, it's always a double edged sword. And so the way I've, I've looked at it and I've talked to different people is like, I mean, if I could pick a place to live, I really, really do like NorCal. I really like where Kelly and them are at. Yeah, come on, However, man. my budget's not fixing to buy myself into San Rafael. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, <laughs> it's, getting, it's just I, getting worse. I, I don't have 2 million to drop on a house from the sixties that needs to be gutted. <laughs> <laughs> and so not crazy. Right. And so uh. 
you know, I started looking at stuff like that because, you know, after I'd lost the other job, there's nothing really keeping me there. I mean, fuck, mm-hmm. as long as I have my phone attention, you know, I can work. And so, you know, we, we talked about it a little bit and then we built the house a couple of years ago and <clears throat> realized that like we built the exact house we wanted uh, with, you know, our nice backyard and set up and we're in a neighborhood that only has 30 houses in it. It's not getting any bigger. I'm an hour from an international airport. And my house was like 280 grand. Yeah. I can live like a fucking king in Louisiana right. on a shitload less money. All right. Yeah. And it's home. I like Louisiana. Yeah. I've, I've never had to shovel hot. Like there's no clear in my driveway in the winter. <laughs> I can <laughs> fucking be outside all year. And so whether I lived here or I live in Louisiana or I was in Denver or I was in fucking Iceland, most of my time is going to be spent in this like four mile radius around my house where I go to this grocery store. I go to the gym. I go to my house. See family. And so, in front of yeah. And so whether I'm at home or I'm here, it's this four mile radius I live in. Yeah. And occasionally you go and do really cool stuff. So I can live there and get on a plane to go do really cool stuff. Right, right, right. <laughs> what, I, what I've noticed more recently, I've never traveled as much as I've traveled since we started the podcast. Sure. I mean, we're probably on a plane every month, right? Almost well, every single month. Like it, yeah, I, I average like 40 flights a year. Do you? Okay, yeah. so here's a crazy thing that I noticed that I never realized before um, we'd started doing this was that you know, uh, um, the the country we live in, America, is so massive. Yeah, it's huge. It's so big, and every state is almost, not quite, but almost like another country in the sense that you can sense and feel different culture, in, like the state culture. 100%. And even in cool. California, you go, to, you go to Southern California, different culture oh, than Northern totally California. Oh, it's totally different than Norco. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You go to Texas, Austin is totally different from Dallas, and you go to Colorado, and that's different, and you go to Florida, and that's different. It's like, and you can almost start to feel... You know, like Floridians are different than yeah. Californians that are different than Texans that are, de- and it's very interesting. Have you noticed this? A hundred percent, right? And and it's that's really cool. You know, as, and I've got to spend some time, you know, in Scotland and you know, in the UK, and then you know, Iceland and some other countries, and like states or countries over there. I mean, like they're not far apart, and that's why everyone learns multiple languages. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, we're fucking huge. Yeah, the U.S. is gigantic. Yeah, and. And not only that, like, it still blows my mind that people live stacked on top of each other. Because you fly east to west, and you're like, there's fucking no one here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's an awful lot, lot of space. empty U.S. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. You could actually fit the entire United States in something smaller than Texas and have lots of rooms. Oh, I think it's something like, like, L- the greater L.A. area yeah. could hold all of the people physically. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, you most know. of the most of the population is, like, on the coast and in a few states. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's, like, Yeah, we follow super- water. Yeah. Otherwise, it's super <laughs> sparse. What are what because you're from Louisiana? What are people from Louisiana like? What are some of the stereotypes or good and bad? Um, I mean, it's a state I've always wanted to visit. By the way, I plan on doing it sometime next there, year. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you've watched like Swamp People or anything like this, right? Like TV show, you know it sure, exists, right? Sure, that fucking exists. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I grew up. Uh, in southern, you know, south uh, western Louisiana, a small town, about thirty thousand people. It's like one high school. Um, but I mean, like we grew up, you know, hunting and fishing and we also trapped alligators and did all that. So, I mean, I've done seasons with 150 plus alligator tags and oh shit, throwing them in boats, shooting them fuck, the whole nine. So I know that that exists and I know the people fucking from those shows. Like I know that chool, chool, you know, down in the bayou, boy. <laughs> you know, fucking, those people exist. And, and, you know, Northern Louisiana is a lot fucking different too. And then New Orleans is its complete own thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, New Orleans is as close to we have as a, a city, and it's a little rougher. And it's also fucking sketchy. New Orleans gets real sketchy really fast. I, I think it's most. I think it's currently the most dangerous city on earth, which is we, we're winning. All right. <laughs> oh, really, well, I know. Number I one. know. Stockton, California, is like was rated number one on yeah. Yahoo like two years ago. Is the worst city to live in. Yeah, for, we go for murder capital. Is what New Orleans <laughs> yeah. is Who's got the murder? Yeah, yeah. and uh, we're real good at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too hot. I would imagine though that's like those are basic stereotypes. Just like I'm sure people see like the Kardashians and they think fucking all of LA and California probably look like that or act Is like it that. Not? <laughs> yeah. yeah, what do you think of California every time you come? I love California. Mm. I like yeah. California a lot. You guys got legal dope. Yeah. Uh <laughs> yeah. we do. California's fucking great. The weather's nice. You mean it's 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 fucking seventy here. I get to wear a hoodie and not be disgusting most of my life. <laughs> it's fucking hot at home, man. Like during the summer. People can't drive here though. No, if, if it starts to rain a little bit, stupid people exist everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stupid people can't drive anywhere at any time it rains. Uh, that's common across Earth. <laughs> um, but 
man, you know, at home, like during the summer, you know, we're 105 degrees and 90% humidity. Oh, so yeah, like my I garage that I train in by myself is like 92. Wow. And wow. You don't need a sauna. No, no. It's pretty like, oh, cool. Heat shock proteins. I'll just go in the attic for fun. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got <laughs> this. So Matt, you, you mentioned, uh, Kelly start being kind, kind of like a mentor to you now where you're at in your life. What about like growing up? Like what, what turned you into the man that you are today? Like, did you have, was your, was, did your father play a big role in that? Or did you have mentors? Like, you know, I, I think a big part was my brother, right? Um, we, we always been really close. And so Andy's four four years older than me or five years school wise so we were never in high school together which was probably great and he was a shitload better at sports than me and so like seeing him excel and never get in trouble and not be a piece of shit like that was like fuck why wouldn't i follow this path this seems to be working out pretty goddamn good (laughs) and so you know i like doing sports and i mean we i don't ever remember a point when i was asked if i wanted to play sports it's just we weren't going to sit around the house so well, you've got soccer tomorrow. Like, oh, okay, soccer starts. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think that, and I think with my parents, I think it was really solid expectations. You know, they weren't crazy, yeah. but, I mean, they were – I also don't think they were relatively – they weren't crazy strict because I did a lot of dumb shit. But there were consequences. You know, there was a set line of consequences. There was, you know, there was good consequences and bad consequences. These are yours to choose on how, the, how you'd like to act. Yeah. And, you know, and then expectations with – school and grades and there was never an expectation from sports side of thing that was just a thing we did yeah we just happened to have some decent genetics and enjoy doing it so it worked out well um, did, did it start with throwing uh played football stuff like that growing up right like um you know football and track through high school did football and track in middle school and then uh got recruited by some smaller schools uh for for college for football but i mean nobody was looking for six foot 270 pound linemen that weren't that fast <laughs> you know at, at schools i wanted to actually block. go to yeah. <laughs> right yeah. and so i was a much better track athlete and so lsu had recruited me so i went there on a scholarship and competed for for four years excellent yeah. Yeah. that's fun tell us about your podcast How, when did you start it and why did you start it i am a sweet seven episodes in yeah you're new yeah Whoa. it's a brand new it's uh, called um so um so yeah <laughs> so I like that just kind of talk about anything. It was, you know, it was just kind of an expansion on getting to do this and, you know, with travel and talk to these people and, you know, maybe have a little bit more in-depth conversation. And it's it's stuff like, you know, being influenced by what Rogan does, which I love is that long format conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, and like, I mean, look, man, if you've only got one gear, I'm not that interested to talk to you. Like, if this is all we're going to fucking talk about, right. like, it's, it's this, this, I get it. We all know how to lift. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Right. What else? Yeah. Right. Right. Why do we do this? It's that's one of our our favorite things when we meet a guest. So we just like again we just got back from L.A. We saw these and we saw people like uh, drama from Fantasy Factory and uh, yeah. who else did we see that was like totally opposite of what we would normally no, nothing to do with health and fitness, right? And I, it, they're just always interesting. they're always scared to talk to us at first because they think we're going to just talk about barbells and dumbbells. Well, sure, day. but I mean, like, I mean, but that's kind of that you know. I, I don't want to meet a bunch of people that, you know, otherwise it's just sitting around smelling my own farts. Right. Yeah. You know, which I'll, is I'll, fun, but yeah, <laughs> yeah it's great. You, you know your oven. own brand. Yeah. 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 It, I want to meet people that don't have my background, that don't do what I do, that don't have any of this. I want, you know, some eye opening life experience. I want some, you know, insight into something. And, you know, I'm not going to gain anything, you know, only talking to someone who mirrors me. Right. Mm-hmm. All the same people. Right. You know, and I mean, while I love, you know, guys like Mark Bell or, or Burdick, like we don't ever have to talk about lifting. We fucking get it. Right. Mm-hmm. right. You know, this is a conversation we don't ever have to have. Right. And Does, so it's the other do, stuff. Do you know comes. how important that is right now? Like, we talk about this on the podcast with where we're going with marketing and what ha- what's happening is, you know, you're on Facebook or you're searching on Google and, you know, now Google and Facebook figure you out and they start yeah. feeding you the same shit. What yeah. you like, here's, you like, you like these, pol- here's the same politics stuff. You oh, get you trapped like in a loop, stuff. man. Yeah. You, mm-hmm. and, and then it gets, and the, the more you get that, right. The more confirmation bias you have, the, the harder it is for you to break free of, of that. And so I can't stress that enough to listeners, especially the younger generation coming up, the importance of seeking out people that you, you might not agree with or seeking out people that do nothing related to what you do right. and making sure that you're always doing that. And then even when you get good information is seeking out the opposing information too. I, 
I can't stress how important that is. It's now. becoming comfortable being uncomfortable. It's part of it. Uh, of course, but that's growth. That's right. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's adaptation to the weights. Right. You know, it's all the same lessons I've learned in the gym. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the biggest lessons I've learned from the gym is the fact that, I mean, the entire time I competed, I trained by myself in my garage and through by myself. No one gives a shit. Like, no one fucking cares if I, if I hit a PR today in the gym. <laughs> right. This is for me. Right. And so... That changes my outlook on training a lot with with ego, because I'm like, oh man, am I going to add five pounds to that bar and go chase a, a single in a garage by myself, or do I take five pounds off and hit a fucking triple? Hmm. Which one of those is going to make me stronger? And ain't mm-hmm. the one. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, do more work. Mm-hmm. Well, that's yeah. interesting because what you see now is everybody making sure they capture it and put it on Instagram, right? <laughs> great you stuff. have to, otherwise uh, it doesn't you know, count. You're a great person to ask that question too. What are some of the things in, <laughs> since we've avoided our field, our obvious field that we're all in, what are some of the things that drive you crazy that you see going on right now? I, for the life of me, I, I just don't understand figure competition <laughs> <laughs> at all. I, I just don't. The um, dog and pony show. I, I get the amount of work and discipline, bodybuilding or bikini or any of that take. It is a fuckload of effort. I have really problems with subjective sports. Mm. They're like, well, I beat you because I fucking threw this further. Mm-hmm. Right. There's this no is a doubt. really yeah. easy way yeah. for us to manage a clear this. line right here. You know, we don't yeah. have to debate anything. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I also don't understand a sport that women allow that butthole shot that they have to post. <laughs> the cross leg yeah. pushback. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it's so it's weird. Like this, yeah, yeah. this is part of your sport? This this is how you judge a thing? Yeah. Like, the guys don't have to fucking do that. You just want to see the judge, like, oh, yeah. Mm, mm, isn't yeah, that, isn't yeah. that, isn't that, isn't which, that I, which I believe that a bunch that of per- perverted old ben guys Moore. came ben up Moore. with that when they were first dull. 100%. Judging, of course, like, you know what? Let's make them do this. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so yeah, fucking it's creepy. weird to me. And it's, I think it's really detrimental. And, and I think, I think a lot of people get into that route, men and female both go the aesthetic route because, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot of talent. It takes discipline. <clears throat> And anyone can fucking have discipline. Right. And so this is a great avenue for people to do that. Right. But I also see it break so many fucking people. And it breaks more women than it does men. Because it, it really... What do you it, think that is? Well, it you... fucking rewards people starving. It rewards hmm. this side of things, not a performance. Right. You know, they're like, oh, fuck, I just have to be lighter than, than next time and browner. <laughs> <laughs> like, fucking, come on, man. Like uh, I love you, man. I wish we could get away from that. <laughs> so I share this on the show all the time, right? When I uh, so I competed, if you didn't know that already, and uh, I used it as a platform to yeah. do what we're doing right now. Like, and I remember I I met a few people who ended up being friends, and I've remained friends with them because they were there's less than a handful, so I can count on one hand how many people I've met in from amateur all the way to professional level that saw it the same way I did. Like, okay, this is getting a ton ton of attention. It's a growing sport. These are all the covers of the magazines. These are the people everyone's looking up to. Let's use that to get some attention and then catapult and then redirect the message. Look, and and backtracking on what I've said, if competing in these things, if you're doing it for you, fuck yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're doing this because this is how you get better, this is how you push yourself, this is how you manage discipline and stress and do all these other things fuck yeah yeah but if you're doing it for some shitty three foot tall bowling trophy <laughs> like, come on <laughs> i'll buy you one well what, you know what i mean like what, what, what i was blown away by was the um the amount of body image issues oh. poor relationships right. with food and poor relationship with exercise that i found uh, but you would have thought that, okay, these are some of the elite physiques that are out there, super disciplined to get there. So if you're that disciplined, I would assume that you were dialed in. And when I got backstage and started talking to all these other competitors, I was floored by how, how terrible the advice was that they were given and the protocol that they were following. Yeah. And I thought, holy shit, these guys are doing so much damage. Yeah. They have no idea. And they're listening to some dumbass coach that's telling their 30 competitors all the yikes, same information. Dude. Just yikes. Yeah, and it, and it's all the way through to the professional level, and I could not believe that. I saw more of that in the competitive world than I ever saw in the thousands of clients that I trained my entire career. Right. So I thought that was really crazy and fascinating. So that's a lot of what we talk about on the show, and I agree with you, man. It's a, 
It is. It's a it's a crazy sport. And it's it's just not for fuck. I don't get it. It's not for me. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, me. more power okay. to you if that fucking yeah. if that's what fucking blows your hair back. Yeah, that's not for me. I, I I just think if you identify with how you look so much, and then you enter into a sport where that's your value is how you look. It can be, not always, but it can be a recipe for disaster. And well, of, of course, right? But the, what it falls back on is it, it's no different than fucking getting leaner and having abs as it is, you know, having more money or, or having this next thing. If you're not fucking happy, those abs ain't going to make you happy. Right. Nor is that extra, you know, 100 grand a year. If you're fucking miserable, you're going to be miserable with cash. Right. So sort your fucking self out. Yeah. You're, and you're not just blowing smoke. There's actual. They've actually done scientific study on this. I mean, yeah. with money, for example, once there is a particular basic me- needs, which is like seventy five or eighty grand, something like that. I think they said seventy thousand dollars. I think they said seventy thousand dollars for a household in America. Beyond that, there is no more. There's no more correlation or, or relationship to becoming more happy. So, in other words, if you have a house, well, there is. It's just to, a really fucking long way away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it, but it, it's just because people are surviving yeah. at, at that level. Like if you're you know, if you're someone struggling and you're making, you know, you two kids, single parent, knocking out 30 grand a year. Definitely. Like you're in this weird spot that you can't fucking get out of. You're just treading water because let, let's say you're making this 30 grand a year and, and you're super frugal and, and you do the right things. So you're putting away 200 bucks a month mm-hmm. away from your expenses and rent and stuff if, like that. If Maybe. You, if you could even do that. Maybe. Yeah. And. Okay, cool. Well, so you also don't have a vehicle that's terribly reliable. Right. So you end up with a flat tire and now need a new, a new tire wheel and alignment. Everything I've saved in the last six months is gone. Gets absorbed right away. Yeah. You know, or now I'm negative. Right. And like, man, that's tough. Like that treading water thing, that that survival, that's tough. And. But once you get out of that, I mean, they even do studies on, on lottery winners. Oh, yeah. They fuck that up all the time. Well, lottery winners, yeah. I think it's like they're, they're, they're happier for like, I don't remember how many years and then done. And then it goes back, back to baseline. Right. So now they're millionaires, but they're still. Yeah, or it's broke. so true. Yeah. Or most of them actually have, <laughs> go broke. Yeah. So blow it all. Broke yeah. Somehow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jim Carrey said, uh, I've quoted this several times now. Jim Carrey recently said, I wish everybody could get rich and famous so they could know that that's not the answer. Right. Yeah. No, it's 100 percent. Right. If you're not fucking happy. You know, that, that was a weird, that was a really weird thing. I spent, you know, I was really broke straight out of college, uh, opened a bicycle shop with a buddy of mine and was real fucking broke doing that for, uh, four years and then got out of that and got a real job that I didn't particularly care about, but it's easier to pay my bills than be upset. So had jobs and shit I didn't like, and then worked up a ladder to a job that paid well enough that things were pretty cool. Right. And then by the time I'd got let go. Uh, in March, I essentially had, you know, hate brand was, was paying me as much as the real job. Mm -hmm. So I've got a sweet income between these two, Mm -hmm. you know, especially for where I live, but there was definitely a weird awakening and like taking a minute to think that like things are okay. When I got fired, I'm like, Oh, my income just got cut in half. Fuck. And then, you know, it was like, like now eight months later, fucking cares. Right. You know, I'm not, I'm not any less happy. I have enough money to do the things I want to do. The really only difference is the amount of money that ends up in a savings account. So some, some fucking weird digital number. That's a high score (laughs) that I don't touch (laughs) anyway. I mean, it's never, I'm never going to be a guy that's like, well, got enough. I guess I'll stop working. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, there's no fucking there. Yeah. Yeah. To the end of this road. It's a dead end. And (laughs) believe it or not, the faster you get there, I think the the sooner you die too. I believe that too, man. People live a little bit longer when they have a job to do. It's got no purpose. That's a fact actually. Yeah. Yeah. Again, backed by science. (laughs) Yeah. You fucking retire. You know what you do? You die. Right. Great work. (laughs) No shit, dude. That's how it is. That's why I tell people all the time. I have no plans of retiring, man. I'll be be doing something till I die. I hope I die fucking doing something. My retirement, the reality is, I mean, besides the hustle and bustle of my kids are young and all that sort of stuff, I'm kind of like, this is almost like retirement for me in the sense that I love so much. I love what I do so much that I really don't consider it. Of course. I get right? tired and all that stuff, but it's not, uh, there's not a second I don't enjoy. Like there's nothing I, at this fucking point. There's nothing I actually hate more than like meeting a stranger 
And they're like, oh, so what are you doing? Like, nothing I hate more than saying I run an apparel company. Like, oh, oh a fucking 35-year-old with a beard run, selling T-shirts, <laughs> <Yeah>. are you? <laughs> Try saying you're a trainer. Right, right. That sounds cool, though, dude. No, just say consultant. Yeah. Just I, I just say unemployed. Yeah. I don't have a job. It doesn't matter. It's like saying you're a writer. Or yeah, an artist. Right. Yeah. I'm an artist. Oh, you're, you're unemployed. Yeah, it's, nothing, I, it's like I say it, and I'd be like, but we're doing really well. Yeah. It's like, I feel like I have to we justify sell it. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Defend no, we're, we're doing good, man. I love it when I tell people I have a podcast. I, I, uh, when I first met my girlfriend, how the hell do you make money? Yeah, when I first yeah, met right. my de- my girlfriend's dad, he's like, "So, uh, so you have a podcast? Yeah. What else? Uh, what else do you? <laughs> what well, else do you do? Yeah, what else all, do you do? That's all I do. Uh, uh, how, how do you? How do you? How does that make money? You guys like uh, like uh, people pay to listen to your podcast? No, no, no. It's a free podcast. Anybody can listen to it. For free. <laughs> it's totally free. It's totally the look free. on his face is like. It's free and you do it and how the I fuck do you make money? Dude, I, I think about this all the time, right? I think about like my grandfather, you know, guy born in the, you know, late 20s, early 30s, you know, died, you know, at 96 or something years old, you know, probably 10 years ago. And I think about conversations with this guy, like World War II vet, blah, 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 guy who worked for fucking 40 years for Exxon, <laughs> you know, did it, did, did the American dream, you know, white picket fence and fucking house and, you know, never moved his entire life. <laughs> and, uh. Like talking to him, he's like, "So, so how's things? How are things going?" He's like, "Well, I've got an apparel company." He's like, "Oh, that's great. You know, uh, so you guys have a store? No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, no store. So, so you you sell stuff online? I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, so people buy stuff. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. So people buy it and you ship it out. And I'm like, well, I don't personally. Yeah. Like, I've got a place that ships it out. Well, they're in Kansas. I've never been there. You know? <laughs> never even met them. No, yeah. no. And I've never been to the warehouse that has all my fucking inventory in it. And he's like. So, so what is it you say you do? It's like, yeah. it's like I take the goddamn information from the customers to the engineers so they don't have to interact. I'm a fucking people person. <laughs> <laughs> I like connect that, people. Yeah. yeah, like that guy on Office Space. Oh shit! With the Go with climb. the stapler. Yeah. yeah, it's like trying to explain to my grandfather yeah. that there's adult coloring books now. Oh what the my fuck god! Fuck are you people so stressed oh, yeah. out about? You fighting Nazis? Is that Dude, adults are that taking going gummy on? vitamins? Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. You Soft, fucking man. Ki- children. Shed some light on what it's like doing, and I know. You don't you don't like to be labeled to that or attached to that, but I think there's a lot of people that have a misconception of either one how easy it is oh I'll just come out I got a cool logo or I have a cool <laughs> brand shed some light on what what it's taken to, to build it to where it can become a sustainable income like you and some of the things that you think are extremely important if you're going to do that. Well, I, I think my credibility in in lifting in the iron sports helped. There's no fucking doubt sure. about it, right? So you had an audience first. Yeah, I had an audience first. I was already doing some YouTube stuff. I was already, you know, writing books and, and had done these type of things. And people relatively knew who I was through through a bunch of different animals, you know, avenues. And this is pre Instagram stuff like that. And so you had you had grown into being a big fish in a small pond by now. So even though your pond is not huge, right? Yeah, yeah. In the Highland Games, yes, right. right? And then I was able to transfer that by starting to go meet, you know, leave my comfort zone to go meet guys like Kelly and Mark and this and that, and then be on Mark's podcast. It's not hard to meet awesome people. It's the tricky part is being someone they'd like to hang out with a second time. <laughs> Great point. You Such know? a good point. Great point, dude. Uh, you know, because then because it, if it's don't just one creepy, we, yeah, we don't have a fucking relationship. Right. Right. You know, you're just you're you're just then an episode. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I want to build relationships with more fucking awesome people. Mm. For sure. And, and that'll play out however it plays. God, that's such an important point, man. Um, your true net worth is your net circle. Yeah, you know, that idea. And and so it's never been this really hard sales thing. And I try to stay away from, you know, trust my gut. I'm like, ah, oh, that feels gross. Let's not do that. You know, yeah. like even the kick today in the dick thing. Like, hey, man, you guys should do a shirt, a shirt with that. Like, no, I wouldn't wear it. Mm. And that's my opinion. Will it sell? Fuck yeah, it would sell. Mm. Am I going to make it? No, I think it's lame. <laughs> so it's my it's my part yeah, right you know what i mean and so you, you got to have a little bit of a line there that you that you don't break and be a genuine person and not and people can fucking smell fuckery yeah yeah they smell it especially today yeah yeah there's so much bullshit out there and look some people get away with it and good on them but uh, that was never going to be the fit for me I'm, i don't have a good enough memory to be a liar yeah. Do you design all your own stuff? Because I think a lot of your stuff is really cool. Um, creative side of it, yes. So typically I will come up with concept and I'll sketch and do that. And I am a terrible digital artist. But I've been really lucky that uh, some guys that I had worked with years past as I tour managed for a band, 
they are very good at it. <laughs> what kind of band? Um, just rock band. Um, nice. Toured around and did did that for a few years and uh, was fun. And then Drew, the guy who uh, who was a singer for the band, now owns a creative agency, uh, this company Slash, and I've known him for 12 years. And so the beauty of working with him is I can show up with what I've got sketched out. And since he doesn't have to go, hey, man, give me five designs from scratch. Right. Like, what, what do you want? Just anything. It's the fucking worst thing you can tell a creative person. Like, and so, so true. yeah, so I show up with what I want and then he can make it into usable digital art, mm. you know, and polish and make it great. And so that's, that's where they come in and, and do that side of it for me. But the actual concepts and all that, yeah, that's all me. Do you have a favorite or a bestseller? Like, um, the original shirt we ever did uh is this kind of craft beer labeled looking uh hate shirt you know it says you know handcrafted in the dirty south and uh that shirt we've kept on the site forever and it has always sold really really well oh, that's cool excellent you seem like a growth minded uh individual what are things or areas that you're currently exploring or growing in that have nothing to do with fitness um so <laughs> business wise or life wise whatever either yeah okay um Man, what excites you the most, I guess, right now? Adventure. Adventure new experiences. That's that's the big one. That's the one I want to chase. And and that for me is What was the last like big adventure for your experience? Uh we were in Iceland for ten days. Um oh, my over, loved Iceland. over over the summer. Beautiful. Went with a group of like eight of us and uh it was fun and it was it was a learning experience to try to have that many people involved in something. <clears throat> and I didn't care for it. There was uh, too many, too many heads, too many. I, it was a great trip. Love all the people I went with, but we were also trying to film and it was just too many fucking people. And then it rained for like seven of 10 days. And so that was, creates its own fucking problems. Mm-hmm. And like nowhere in Iceland's close to the next place. <laughs> and so as soon as you leave Reykjavik, like everything's a long way away and something that's like, oh, okay, cool. That's 30 miles from here. That may take an hour. Mm. Uh, so it's. It's that that I'm trying to learn from. I'm trying to learn management of time better. I'm trying to learn those things from those trips. And, and then, you know, the other side of that trip was like, you know, the six months we took to fucking plan it and like where we were going to hit every day in this itinerary basically was fucking out the window because of the weather. And so I was like, all right, well, now what's the story? And the story was, you know, experiencing this awesome place with the people that we were with, not this weird plan that we had set out with before. And so... I mean, if anything, I, I want to learn to be a little bit less in the driver's seat. Mm. You know, maybe take back and just let's let's do what happens. Or you were you a did you feel like you were a control freak before? I was, or you, I was trying to. Mm. You know, I was really trying to because I. It's tough when you're self made. When you're a self made guy, it's you you learn to do that. Yeah, right. You learned you got to where you're at by being that guy. Right, right, so. right. You know, we're, we're all that guy. All of us are very comfortable making fucking choices all day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you have a group of eight people. You know, there's some choices that don't need to be fucking up for debate. Like, just tell us where we're going to eat. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> no, let's not spend the next fucking four hours talking about dinner. Let's just go. I'm just going to say we're going here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that that decision's made. Right. Or like, <clears throat> we're getting gas and then doing this. <laughs> That's it. You know, like, most people are like, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, you know, it's learning from that. Um, it's like trying to figure out where to eat with your girlfriend. Yeah. You, you know, and as Where much as I'm trying to get new experiences from shit like that and travel and and those things, I'm very interested in also diving deeper into me and like what makes me tick and why do I feel this way and those type of things. And so there's definitely some interest I've got in, in psychedelics and some stuff like that kind of going forward. Is that more recent? Very recent. Oh. That, oh. That's a real recent thing for me. I've got no experience with it from a younger years in my life or anything like that. And so what's you know, it done for you? Um, and it, man, I'm, I'm still really fresh. And so there's, there's been just a little bit of like microdosing mushrooms or something like that. Mm. And, and so you haven't gone full on. No, I haven't gone full, full barge. Um, had some cool moments in my backyard with clouds. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, had some insightful stuff, you know, that I thought about while, while being pretty high. And then, you know, I've, I've dipped a toe in the water enough to go like, yeah, I want to see where that goes. And I'm glad at 
35 and relatively confident in who I am and secure with my own feelings on things about where that journey will be, Mm -hmm. you know, that I'm along for the ride. I'm not here to drive that boat either. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Anything, anything right now that you, you know, when you say you're unpacking about yourself, right. Or digging deeper into yourself that tends to come back or you have triggers for, and you got to constantly like remind yourself like, ah, I got to, I got to pull back on that. That's, those are my old bad habits or. Yeah. I mean, look, man, we're all self-destructive in, in certain ways. And you know, whether that's going to be, you know, food issues or shit like that. I mean, hell, you know, since, since I got hurt with my knee, I've dropped 60 pounds. Oh, wow. I, I don't need to fucking weigh 290 pounds at six foot. I'm not, if I'm not throwing anymore. Right. You know, so that's, that's been a lot of lessons. And, what have you and, done to lose the weight? Are you just changing your diet training? I mean, look, I, I did ketogenic style diet. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm always weird about saying that because I didn't track ketosis the whole time. You just drop carbs and up your fat. Yeah, up my fat, drop my carbs, and I lived in a caloric deficit for a year. Which is a better way to talk about it, anyways? Because I hate yes. I hate all the fucking names yeah, for it, true. anyways. Yeah. Like that's yeah, what, it's all what, for marketing oh, reasons. Hey, right? what'd you do to lose weight? I lived in a fucking caloric deficit for a year. Right, right. It worked out. And stopped eating weird. so much probably processed carbohydrates yeah, yeah. and switched I, over to eating healthy yeah, fats. I switched to food that was. <clears throat> is it green? Or did it have a face? <laughs> yeah. And if it's both, yeah. well, there you go. One of them cried. Eat some frog. That's yeah. it. If it, <laughs> if, if it crawled, ran, swam, or, you know, you know any of those things, if it's, it was self-propelled, <laughs> <laughs> or is it a green plant, I can eat as much of it as I want. Mm. People don't tend to binge on steak and kale. It's crazy. You know, or it's broccoli, crazy. you know. I've done it. And, oh, same. You know, with that, with that said, I'm, I mean, I'm a garbage disposal. I can fucking throw food in, and there's not much I don't like. But you know, it was that's that's discipline to learn. You know that that bit has been. Has it been a challenge losing that much weight and changing? Because 290 pounds at six foot, pretty much any room you walk into, you're the biggest you're the biggest fucker in the room. Did it well? Maybe not the rooms you walk into. Weird friends. I was just fat. (laughs) (laughs) Did did it? Did did, was that a challenge? Now that you're, you know, so much smaller or lean or whatever, was it a challenge to change like that, or was it easy? Um, the only, the only, it's it's been nothing but positive response so far because I'm still, I mean, I'm still 240 pounds, and yeah, you're still a big boy, you're a big guy. I'm I'm strong and stuff like that, and it's weird having some strange shadow of abs. That's never existed, <laughs> but like I've flirted into kind of the mid two thirties and stuff like that. And like went into a store recently and had picked up a shirt and like got home and put it on as an, as an XL. And it was bigger than I like shirts to fit. And I was like, Hmm, <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to larges. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So time to get back in the gym boys. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, I could so identify yeah, with that yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Cause I'm, a, I'm an, large. I'm an XL guy. I'm probably the lightest I've been in the last three years right now. And I've been totally good with it. I've been totally fine. I've been enjoying it. And, uh, my mobility is better than it's ever of been. Course, I right. feel great. Like, uh, but I, you know, I slid on a shirt that I hadn't worn in a long time and it was like, Oh shit! I'm not really feeling this shirt out anymore. <laughs> yeah. like, I am not going to large, dude. Back in the gym. No, that no, was literally my my uh, mentality last week. I swear to God, that's so hilarious. That you you know, just like, said I know, that. you know, my wife doesn't like things to fit as tight as I do, so she, you know, will wear wear like mediums. I'm like, I'm not one size bigger than her. This isn't gonna. Fit. <laughs> <laughs> that's <fucking> stupid. <laughs> I'm gonna have to sort this oh, out. Oh shit! So, oh, man. you know, there's it's just all changes, right? And I mean. You know, I sure as shit at 35 don't want to be the guy I was at 30. And I sure as shit don't want to be the guy I was at 25 mm-hmm. or 21 or 18. Mm-hmm. And I really hope at 40, I feel this way again. Right. You know, and at 45 and 50. Right. I, I tell you, there's something. I don't Abraham know. Lincoln, man. I have no respect for a man that's no wiser today than he was yesterday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, live by that. There's something. Uh, I don't know, man. There's something great about your 30s as a man i feel like that's kind of when you i I mean correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like it's when i like i really feel like you're comfortable with yourself yeah like i'm really me and it makes me actually look forward to the next decade like what's that going to be in my 40s shit i feel like at 30 you really you just turn the switch on to start trying to learn about yourself yeah the first 30 years i I gotta figure who this is yeah your brain fucking doesn't work at all until you're over 25 (laughs) you basically shouldn't be allowed full testosterone and cum you should wear wear a fucking helmet most of the time and use nerf utensils (laughs) (laughs) nerf utensils (laughs) so but like yeah after 25 you start like you know there's part of you that's like 
I got to stop getting fucked up and going out and doing these things. Like, that story's old. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I know the experiences I'm getting from that. And you should mm-hmm. say, what's next? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, five or six years into, you know, your early 30s, you've hopefully been maybe at the same job for a while, yeah. having an income and have some expendable income. Because, I mean, look, things are real fucking comfortable here in America. <laughs> You know, I don't have an invading army. I don't have any of these things. And so I'm not going to get drafted off to war. Right. And so, you know, you can you can focus on that and try to be part of that growth and then, you know, worry about your own ego, right? Right. You know, because I don't have any of these stresses that our ancestors have had, which is why I think people can be so fucking offended by everything now. Oh, it's yeah. Because we're wildly comfortable. We're not busy enough. Let's just be clear that there's four people in this room you know, who who make a living talking, not, not only that. just talking, but talking about doing fucking fake work. <laughs> <laughs> like, like yeah. we all have muscles. We don't yeah. need to survive. Yeah, right. We we're not all stacking have, yeah, hay in the barn. Yeah, we're not fucking no. doing construction work 10 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. Is we do fake work to make up for the the yeah. softness our lives up provide. and goes away. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's because it. this is what we do all day. My job requires me to sit in a chair <laughs> yeah. and punch away on a device that holds all the information of forever in it. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> like it's fucking, awesome and it's fucking crazy. It yeah, yeah it should be though, right? Like yeah. like we're fucking this is the best time to be alive ever. Yeah. It is. Yep. The people that are like, oh, I'd love to be back alive in the seventies. I'm like, fuck that, man. Central air and heat, and I can get on airplanes, they're not full of smoke. This is fucking wonderful. Right. <laughs> yeah. People yeah, people it we're, I think that's why people freak out so much with the whole offending and all that stuff. It's because we're wired to be under stress and because there is none, we gotta make it up. Yeah, you gotta of create course. it. We have to create we it. We have yeah. to invent it. We're so soft. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, this is why we see the rise, I think, of things like the Spartan race and stuff like that. Yeah. Where I think, I mean, it's, it's ex- artificial. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's exploding. And I think it's because we become so plugged in and we're we're so detached from our own selves that right. we need to feel again. Right. I need some mud in my face. I need to hurt a little bit. I need to fall, you know? Yeah. Like, it's I'll, cr- I'll never forget. My kid was, he was, let's see, he must have been six. He was young. And uh, they were just in art, you know, class or whatever, drawing and stuff. Maybe five, maybe younger. And he drew a picture of, you know, the school, and then there were kids, and they were shooting machine guns, and grenades were flying. Mm-hmm. And we got called into the office. Holy it's happened to me too. No, we got called into the office with for my five year old with a meeting with the principal because there's there's bombs and guns and stuff, and there's a picture of the school. Have and you stuff. seen the news? And I'm like, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, Mike. I said, listen. I said, my kid's five. He's five. He's a boy. That's what five year olds do. You know what I? You know. Do they not sell army men anymore? Is that not a thing? I no. bet they don't now. No, Who no, knows? No, no, no. Yeah. Let me, okay. I good question. I dressed up. I dressed up as a for Halloween. I dressed as a mobster, like a, yeah. you know, a gangster, right? So I order my costume on Amazon. So I'm like, oh shit, I need a Tommy gun. They don't sell fake guns on Amazon at all. None. What? No. I had. You know what they sold? A blow up. God a blow up Tommy gun. Get out. I'm like, I'm not going to go like <laughs> getting getting toy water guns that looked real and painting them to look like real. Oh shit! Uh, or yeah. real we, guns. The airsoft just, guns. Look yeah. Like. Fuck. We were just talking about this yesterday or the day before when we were flying back from L.A. I said uh, we used to play. Uh, we used to shoot each other with BB guns. Yeah. It, was just, yeah. it was the one pump rule. You yeah. can only pump one time, <laughs> right. and, you, and you always fucking knew when your friend Arm pumped system, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that or paintball or any of this shit. Right. right? Oh god, man. No. I spent my entire kindergarten making weapons for, to mock, like play predator yeah. <laughs> right you, you know like with like these large tinker toy type things i kind of got kicked out of school yeah, oh, yeah. what the you're fuck's got, wrong with this kid yeah you got thrown in jail oh, I likes the church party. drawing people there's a, up. there's a saying yeah. what is it that tough times make uh good men good men make good times good times make weak men weak men make bad times yeah and then the cycle starts over and over yeah there was a i had a Across the street, my grandparents lived across the street from us growing up, and um, so it was my grandfather, my grandmother, and her sister. And I remember asking my my aunt, I guess is what she technically is, or great aunt, or something like that, right? And sister is what we called her. And um, I remember asking her like, "Why were Why were you never married?" You know, and this was like fucking ten or twelve, right? And she just fucking says, "All the good men died in the war." Damn. Just fucking boom. You know, and I've always thought about that. And there's a weird quote that basically says, like, our country now is, you know, generations that were raised by cowards and cripples. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, man, there's something there's something to be said about that idea that that everyone fucking left. 
that 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 World War II was a major fucking change to society. Huge, yeah. huge. You know, you know, you know. There's so here's what's what's interesting is that when you look at uh, between when you look at men and women and you look at the spectrum of you know on the left is and I don't mean this politically. I mean if you just look at a chart on the left, you've got people who are insane, go to prison, lose their minds, and way on the right, you've got brilliant minds, inventors, whatever. Men make up a larger percentage of either end, sure. Because and some and scientists will say it's because our brains are designed to be a little bit more or designed or evolved or whatever you believe in are a little more extreme. And the reason the behind that and the prevailing theory behind that is because men are expendable. Because you could have a society where you have uh, ten women to every man, it works. and it would it would survive and flourish. Yeah, you could not have a society. With ten men to every woman, because uh, it just no. it just wouldn't work. Because it does not procreate. Very it doesn't well. procreate very well, and it's because we ki- we died, yeah. we killed each other through wars and shit like that all the time. And not saying that it's a good thing, but no, but it is a fact. It's a fact, yeah, and because not- <laughs> and, and because we don't have lots of challenges the same way that we had before, uh, it it does. It's it's interesting. It's, we almost have to create challenges for ourselves, fake challenges. It's like uh, it's like that scene in the Matrix when. Uh, you know, he's talking about the first matrix. We made the yep. first matrix to be perfect, but it just crashed and didn't work because the human mind couldn't comprehend this you know, right. perfection. They had to create this, you which, know. Which is even more impressive, right? That that there are people, like, like thank fuck we live in a time that I can make the choice to still train and work out and fucking not eat like an asshole. <clears throat> And, 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 and watch and, Stranger and, Things on Netflix. Yeah, and, 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 and travel and, and do this. Like, yeah. fucking, it's great. Yeah. Things yeah. are fucking great. Right. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I know other people are, you know, have way harder times than me, but like, I'm not a dude who's going to sit there and cry about shit. No, it's a double edged yeah. sword. It's like you have, because you have this free time, because you have things are so awesome compared to human history, throughout human history, <clears throat> you can either choose to, to, to try to grow. Uh, in ways you want to, not in ways you have to. Like right. I don't have to grow in in hand to hand combat because it's not necessary. But I choose to grow in the way I learn things or the way I treat people or whatever. Or I can sit here and choose to just be complacent and not grow, which is not. It's bad. It's terrible. No, it's, bad. it's terrible for the brain. Terrible for the body. Um, and terrible for society. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, like you said, get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's right. You know, that's that that's what a lot of it's about. I mean, you know, that that mentality of like things are fucking awesome right now. Mm-hmm. That that's been a big part of I mean shit, the last two years I've essentially I've had seven knee surgeries in the last two years. And so that's been pretty fucking rough. That went from the last time I competed, <clears throat> I took What'd you some, what'd you do to your knee? A lot. Okay. Uh, so last time <laughs> I if competed, you had seven, you pretty yeah. much did everything I would have Yeah, I've done everything <laughs> except replacement. Um so the last time I competed in the Highland Games, I took second at a world championship. And then essentially it was like, okay, cool. I'm never throwing again. And it's been, I've done four ACLs. They just don't take. Uh, body just rejects them. And so at this point, it's just like, all right, fuck it. We're not going to have one of those. Um, but I did, the 10 years I competed, I did without an ACL. Uh, wow. I tore it post-college and, uh, or I tore it in college, got it fixed, and then tore it again while I had a bike shop and no money. So we're not fixing that. Um and then tore meniscus uh, really late in my career, I guess at the end of it now that it's late in my career because I'm not doing it. Um, <clears throat> so got that fixed, went to fix the ACL, did this oats procedure to try to uh, implant some cartilage on the femoral head. And it's just never quite been right. So it's been fixing this and that. And it, it's essentially like there was so much wrong with my knee that it was all trying to get through a hole. But because there was so much wrong with it, like nothing can get through, so there's no problem. <laughs> but as soon as we fix something, like fuck it, everything else can shoot through. And be like, hey, <laughs> what about us over here? We're shitty too. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it's just you know it's been ongoing, and, and and you know that's been a real struggle and a lot to learn from. Of like, okay, cool, I'm gonna walk with a limp for two years and not squat and not deadlift, and how do you stay metabolically intact? And how do I how do I still push myself in the gym and do stuff like that? Because I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's it's effort. You know, choose to fucking put in the effort. And that's that's growth in anything. I mean, you could sit there and woe is me, like, fuck, I don't get to compete anymore. This is what I loved and blah, 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 blah. I mean, let's just be clear. 
in the last 10 years after winning two world titles, I've met all my favorite people. I got to travel around the world and compete in a silly sport. I got to make a few bucks. I wrote a book about it that now is a business that I run that essentially pays my life. That's worth money. Good fucking trade. But don't you find that rare as far as an athlete to be able to disassociate themselves with that identity? Of Of course it is. Of course it is. But I just think they're fucking real short sighted. Yeah. You know, I mean, the thing I've always said to people is like when I look back at throwing in college, right? Like that was uh, 14 years ago, right? Like those memories are like looking at something in third person. That's not me. Same way I feel about looking back at high school football. That's not me anymore. Mm. And and this thing throwing that I did while I loved it and, and I'm passionate about strength, like none of my fucking PRs or world championships are going to make my tombstone, man. Yeah. That's a fucking thing I did. Mm-hmm. That's it. Right. Mm-hmm. That's a different chapter and that chapter's closed. God, so, so what many, the fuck's yep. next? So many people have a hard time with that. Right <laughs> what there. a great, what a great uh, attitude on things. Do you, do you like to read? Yeah. Do you, do you, what are some books that you're into now? Um, I, I say, yeah. So I, I do more books on tape with traveling. Um, same difference. Yeah. Same, same idea. Um, downloading the information. The books I've, I've, <clears throat> I've tried recently. I end up like halfway through a lot of stuff. Um, like I, I picked up like subtle art of not giving a fuck yes. and I got about two hours into it. And I was like, I already feel this way. <laughs> like I already preach to the yeah. choir, but it's a great book. Yeah. I already I don't give a shit about most of the things apparently most people yeah. care about. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't, I don't need to waste the next four hours being validated. Uh, you know, I want something that's going to make me, you know, think different routes. And so a lot, a lot of that, I stick to podcast. I almost consider podcast as fucking reading. Yeah, mm-hmm. yep. You know, I'm, I'm great getting, place to consume information. Right. It's just I want to consume more information, whether that or YouTube or any of these other type of things, and. Like I stick, I stick with that. Like book wise, man, I guess, man, I guess I really don't fucking read very much. <laughs> it's the truth of it. But, um, I'm interested in Tim Ferriss's new book. Um, the one with mentors. Mm-hmm. I think that one's interesting. And part of that's because Mark's in it and Ed Cohn's in it. Well, shit, he did. I mean, what he did was you refer to podcasting is, I mean, he yeah. just took all just of his, in pod, yeah. his podcast, basically, and the information there and put it in a book. Which really, is really smart. Yeah. Good work, Tim. Yeah. yeah. I know, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. We might steal that one later on. Yeah, yeah right on. At some it's point. A, a brilliant idea for well, sure. It's another way for people to digest information. I mean, I mean, what's the last real new innovation that's come in lifting? Right. Yeah. So we've all been regurgitating the Crickets. same shit. Yeah, to people, but where where people fuck stuff up and where I fuck stuff up for for lifting, and I think guys like you guys do a really good job that I struggle with is that the crowd is the beginner. I mean, you guys don't need to fucking motivate me to lift. I'm right. not I'm not your target mm-hmm. audience, right. nor no. are you mine. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it's the guy who's just started lifting and is now finding interest in the barbell. And that's been the real shift that I'm trying to to become. And that's whether it's fucking through CrossFit or it's through Highland Games or through powerlifting or anything. If you want to pick up a barbell to get better, I'm interested. Mm. I don't fucking care how you got there. Yeah. You know, I have more in common with you than I do someone who doesn't. Right. And, you know, it's, it's that information. And, you know, what is, you know, maybe nothing, maybe there isn't a lot new out there as far as those things, but. There really isn't. When you think about what we see, I mean, it's all about how you communicate. It's like resurrecting, right. yeah. Yeah, if anything, Ideas. you see, yeah, you see, you know, kettlebells and mace bells and Indian clubs. I mean, these things have been around for, for, forever. Forever. Right. And now they're coming back around because, because you know why? Because none of that machine bullshit stuff that we've invented over the last 20, 30 years is better than what we've been using for hundreds of years. No, it, and it's and it's variety. Right. You know, variety is the spice of life. And, and, and most people get so fucking bored that they need that change right you know to do something different whereas like i i don't need that in the gym i'm good i can you know hey man how do i get strong like i don't know man bench squat deadlift once a week moderately heavy for the next decade <laughs> be fine <laughs> it's yeah, so true it's your way up. sort yeah. itself out yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's you know, so, so some true. weeks go heavier than you did before maybe do some or less reps <laughs> do some for a few for the next 10 fucking years you'll be just fine <laughs> there you go <laughs> you know great that's great i think you just wrote a book yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. chapter one and done yeah <laughs> one, page. one and done right well shit man uh, awesome good, talking yeah yeah good, yeah man good time dude this, this is great o- obviously won't be the last time we do this look forward yeah. to hanging out with you more often let's uh i say we go get some lunch i love 
get lunch. Yeah, oh, dude, dude. Let's lunch. <laughs> yeah, let's Me and Hannah are friends forever. Let's we don't do get it. to get lunch very let's often. Do, let's do we it. have something else in common. Yeah. Let's do yeah. some lunch, and then we'll come back and hang out some more, man. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Check it out. Go to uh, Mind Pump TV on YouTube. We post a new video every single day. That's 365 videos a year. That's Subscribe a to our channel. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>